In the past, most of the popular American sports had fans cheering mostly for their home teams. They lived and died by the win-loss record in pursuit of major trophies and bragging rights. Then came fantasy football. It changed the way we approach sports. There was more than just a focus on individual teams and more on the individual players. It made every game important. We cared more about our own win-loss records in pursuit of our own trophies and bragging rights and money. There have always been a million ways to bet on sports, but fantasy sports elevated that to a new level. And with that came experts. And that became big business. And we're lucky to have one of the original experts, a grandmaster of fantasy football. We have Adam Levitin from Establish the Run on this episode of Five Dollar Buzz. <laughs> Step inside, lock the door behind you. Uh, please make sure the towel's properly positioned. You're stepping in on another $5 buzz. Uh, George Kursar here, as always, with uh, my two co-hosts, Roger and Pete, out in L.A. How's the weather out there, guys? I know the gas prices uh, are surging, but may- at least you guys got uh, – you won the weather lottery, right? Yeah, the weather's nice out today. Rain this morning. You know, which is unusual, but, you know, it's nice out here right now. It's probably about uh, 75 degrees outside and sunny, beautiful. Cool. Pete, how's Pete? it going, man? Yeah, it's gorgeous, how's, man. How's West Hollywood, Pete? West Hollywood is great. It's only $123 to fill up a Jeep Grand Cherokee right now. Oh, that <laughs> sucks, man. Well, if you guys are looking for a little uh, extra side money, uh, a great way to earn that is, you know, gambling. Uh, fantasy and we're very lucky today to have one of the definitive names in the dfs fantasy sports uh world uh none other than adam levitan from established the run how you doing today adam i'm doing well thanks for having me cool man how's things in uh rocky mountain high colorado today uh nice weather or what's it looking like oh yeah it's always beautiful here it really is like uh you know, I don't think people realize uh, it's sunnier than California here. I mean, we get 300 days of, of sunshine a year. Uh, Wait, where do, you, where do you live specifically in Colorado? A little bit south, about 20 miles south of Denver. Yeah, I, I, I lived in Colorado Springs for four years. So nice. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Castle Pines. So so yeah, about 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 an hour north of there. So yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's it's been amazing. I mean, the, even when it's cold, if you're in the sun, it's it's not cold. So it's it's great. Yeah, dope. And obviously, you got the skiing, you've got the uh, recreational uh, all over the place. So there's a lot of opportunity in Denver. You know, it's still a city that's growing, even though most folks coming from the East Coast, like Philadelphia, New York, you know, obviously, we all think of Denver as like this major city, which it is, but it's still a developing city with that railroad coming from DIA. And you got some of these big restaurants coming in for the first time. So it's just exploding. And I think that uh, CU Boulder, is starting to be like a young tech training ground. So there's a lot of infusion mm. of young talent. Is that fair to say? Mm, cool. I don't know about that, but yeah, that sounds cool. I mean, the camp, the school is amazing. Yeah. I've been up there a few times. Yeah. Cool. Well, Adam, uh, we'd love to just hear, I- I'm a avid listener of your podcast and I know you got a big following uh, and rightfully so the show is great, but um, your origin kind of starts in, is that Fairfax County, Virginia, or was, is that where you grew up? That is. Yep. Fairfax County. Exactly. Yeah, I got a buddy down in Reston, so I've been down there. Nice. Uh, so that's interesting, right outside D.C. And uh, after, you know, growing up in that area, you went up to Penn State. Uh, is mm-hmm. that where you did your undergrad studying, right? Yep, exactly. Yep, Penn State. Was that during the era of, like, Courtney Brown and LeVar Arrington and all those guys? So uh, my four years there, I was there from 2000 to 2004. They, those were the worst four years cumulative record wise in Penn State football history so uh, we had the Zach Mills uh, uh, era this was right after the year before I got there was when LeVar Arrington jumped over the line uh, and made the famous play so yeah I saw yeah I saw the um, the worst four years of Penn State football history yeah exactly but LeVar wasn't there when you were on campus was he correct no LeVar no LeVar no Courtney Brown either yep yeah, they all, what they went one and two overall. And Roger, sorry to jump in, but the funny story is uh, I got a buddy. I live in Fairfield, Connecticut, you know, right north of New York City. And uh, 
a lot of ex lacrosse guys in uh, Connecticut. And uh, one of them, he was telling me a story about his buddy was on the Gettysburg lacrosse team. And Gettysburg is a pretty good D3 lacrosse team. And they showed up to play Penn State. I don't know if it was like preseason scrimmage and like the whole team gets off the bus. And these are, you know, pretty big guys, lacrosse team. And LeVar Arrington comes walking out of the tunnel and it's like 30 guys and LeVar Arrington, no shirt on, just him. <laughs> he's like, who are you guys? And they're like, oh, we're Gettysburg lacrosse. And he's like, you guys are nothing but a bunch of fucking bitches. <laughs> I think he would have squared off with the whole team. This was like peak era LeVar Arrington leapfrogging future NFL uh, running backs. So, uh, yeah, Roger, I, I know you had a thought there. No, I, I actually, I didn't. I was just an interjection. So, but, you know, tell us more. I mean, so you, you go from boom go to college what what happens to you right after college yeah i i i was a journalism major i thought i'd be like a beat writer uh you know and cover cover team uh, i did that for a while I, I was just like i did it for a little bit i was just so bad at it and and it's really not me it's you know more about schmoozing people and no. kissing their ass and getting them to tell you stuff that that they're not supposed to more than you know knowing about sports or writing or anything and but i had a chance to write a fantasy uh, article uh once a week and, and uh, kind of parlayed that into working at Roto World and and then uh, uh, quit there in in 2015 to uh, do the DFS thing. So so yeah, that's the the kind of cliff notes of it. But when you were, I think you were writing or you were working at a paper in Philly. Bef- in between there, you had a pretty uh, you know significant time playing poker up in Atlantic City. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so like the first job I had, uh, I got fired within like three months or, or laid off or, or whatever at, at the sports network. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, I, you know, I wasn't too worried about money just from, from playing poker, but you know, I was working maybe 10 or 15 hours a week at, at a newspaper. Um, and then I was living, I, you know, I was busy living at Borgata. I was, uh, uh I was there three or four nights, uh, a week, uh, when Borgata first opened and, uh, 2003, 2004. And, and so, yeah, those were, those were fun times, man. I mean, um, uh, the poker boom was in full swing and, and I was, you know, pretty young, you know, 22 to, to 28 and, and just, you know, fucking around and, and, and playing poker and, and, you know, didn't really have to try too hard. Everybody was so bad. And yeah, it was just, the, those, those were, those were good days for sure. You still hungered it, huh? You, you were the kid. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go that far. Uh, but yeah, yeah, those were those were the days. And that, this is when, you know, ESPN was covering poker like pretty significantly, like it was one of the yeah. big four sports, right? Yeah, I mean, that was like the number one customer acquisition thing, you know, I mean, uh, I think people think that, you know, advertising or, or whatever is the best way. I mean, uh, you know, best way to get your product out there is to have like an actual event that ESPN covers. I mean, so my God, I mean, when people saw that on TV and the way ESPN covered it, they covered it so well and it made it so compelling. I mean, there's just, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people who saw poker on TV and, and thought they could play. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And yeah, any interesting it was, it really was huge. Wait, though. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I watched it religiously. I yeah, mean, I when it. they started covering and, and you're right, the way they had, they set the camera up underneath the cards and, yeah. and, and they turned them around fairly quickly. Cause I'm like, how, how are they showing everybody the cards, even just and not, and not having a scene in the room. And were you able to, I was, did you ever go to any of those events? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I, played the, I played the world series a bunch. Uh, yeah, it was fun. I wasn't too much. I didn't play tournaments. Uh, uh, too much. Uh, mostly played cash and poker, but I played uh, World Series maybe I don't know three or four, five times or something like that. Who, who, like that. who would you, who have you sat with that that would be a recognizable name? Yeah, I played. I, I played with all, all those guys. I played with Negreanu. I, I no kidding. Hel- Helped me for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, yeah. I mean, it's kind I, of I, a I, small world, even when you're there. You know what I mean? It's big, but it's small at the same. Time. Well. I, it's similar to DFS, you know, kind of at, at low stakes and at medium stakes, there's so many people you would never, you know, know people, but at high stakes, you know, there's, there's not that many people playing. And so you get to know people that are playing, uh, playing big, you know, and, and you get to know the player pool. There might be only, you know, uh, 50 people that would ever go to Borgata and play high stakes. And so it's not hard to get to know all those people, you know? So, uh, so yeah, it, it's the small world at the top for sure. You ever played the high, high stakes game? 
never okay. never played with never never played with phil ivy i think he's been in like macau for the last like eight years or something like that but even before that i never i never played with him he's considered the king of the cash game yeah no he's the band adam what was it like on like a tuesday night in atlantic city obviously if anyone hasn't been there it's certainly not the uh the flash it's not like going to a a, a nice restaurant in vegas ac yeah. is kind of dodgy on the boardwalk and you know some of those uh trump owned places are super sketchy um anything anything stick out like was there a lot of yeah. it was it was kind of dangerous quite frankly right in that part of new jersey right oh yeah i mean atlantic city's dump or, or you know was a major dump then for sure i i um the one thing that Borgata did, and I think one of the reasons Borgata was so successful was there in the marina, meaning like you don't have to go on the boardwalk at all. Like you get to Borgata, there's nothing else around. You don't walk around. When you go to Borgata, you stay there. They have the best restaurants, the best poker. And like, that's where everybody played. Like there was, I mean, they just killed all the action everywhere else there. And at that time, there was also no poker in Philly. There was no poker in New York. There was no poker in Delaware. I mean, if you wanted to play, you literally had to go to Atlantic City and everybody, all the action was at, was at Borgata. And so, you know, nobody would really leave. I, I, I played at the Taj a little bit, which is no longer exists, but I mean, yeah, Taj was just a, a total, total dump. I mean, dirty chips and disgusting people and, you know, people getting stabbed outside and stuff like that. And, and yeah, I mean, the uh, Atlantic city on the boardwalk was, is a mess for sure. Yeah. Even back to the days of chalky white Pete, I don't think they've made too much <laughs> progress. Right. <laughs> but Adam, so it's interesting that you were, you were right at the kind of genesis of like the poker boom, like the, the early turn of the century. And then it seems like most guys our age, you know, uh, you know, our generation, like generation X, early millennials, fantasy was a staple of their life. You know, you'd go to the drugstore, you'd get the magazine, you'd, you try and leverage as much knowledge as you can, but you know, I would say right around that time, ESPN and C CBS, they were all offering online uh, ways to draft with your buddies. You all didn't necessarily have to be in the same room. So you kind of, what kind of made you make the leap and think that could be a career? But I'm assuming at that point, you never thought that you'd be owning your own company, running your own podcast. Like it's, it's gotta be kind of a surprise, right? Or did you have a vision? No, I mean, at that time, uh, you know, we're talking, I, I first started writing fantasy football articles and talking about fantasy football on Twitter, you know, in 2005, 2006. I mean, there was like no competition. I mean, there was like nobody. There was no fantasy podcast. There was no, you know, I feel like I was one of the first, you know, 10 people talking about fantasy football on Twitter ever. And so like, you know, uh, being right place, right time for sure made a huge difference. I was already playing poker when poker got popular. You know, obviously I was already into fantasy when fantasy started really blowing up and, and, and same with DFS. So yeah, I mean, um, the market's so saturated now. I think if I like graduated college now and tried to do what I'm doing now, I would just be like drawing dead. I mean, it would be, it'd be almost impossible. Um, and yeah, like being first is, is, you know, even if you're not that great at something being first makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Yeah. And so I, I always like encourage people to, to try things where they're first. Cause I mean, it's really hard to be the best at something, but you know, hopefully you can come up with something where you're, you're at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so you, when you were, uh, when you were at Roto world for a little while, was that like the first place that you, uh, you know, were being compensated as like a fantasy, uh, ex would, would you call yourself a fantasy expert? Is that how yeah. they viewed it? No, I mean, I, I, I started at Roto World. I, f I feel like it was 2007, 2006. I don't know, somewhat, somewhere in there. And I was just part time doing uh, news blurbs, you know, and, 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 you know, that was the best. I mean, it, it, Roto World at that time was, was really awesome. I mean, everybody used Roto World for their fantasy information. And I, I just did the news. I, I asked to do articles. They said, well, you know, we don't really need people writing articles right now, but we do need people on news. So that's how it got started. Um, just, you know, looking for news. And at that time, like Twitter wasn't that popular and stuff. It was, I, I would read the newspapers and, and if I found something interesting, I would put it on, on Roto World. And so, yeah, th those were th those, that was kind of the beginning for, for sure. And, and at that time, like I said, I mean, there was like nobody that had full-time jobs in, in fantasy, maybe like five people total, you know, like Matthew Berry and Greg Rosenthal and like a couple other people. And that was it. Do you uh you're round do you do how many different sports do you uh write about yeah I, I used to um uh play basketball uh play fantasy basketball and and some baseball but now I only 
uh, play football and, and we have a team uh, at the site that works on NBA, but I'm not really involved in the day-to-day for that. So, so yeah, right now at the site, we're just covering uh, football and basketball and I'm, I'm only playing football. And then during the period between, you know, uh, the season, what, what do you focus on mainly uh, off season? Yeah. My tennis game. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I just signed up football specifically. What are you looking at? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's a lot of work on the business, you know, like it's just gotten to the point, uh, for the business where like the upside and and uh, you know, the, the opportunity for the business is just way more than I could ever make uh, playing. And so, um, it, it's you know, when you're not behind the scenes, it's it's hard to tell. It's like, oh, what is what does management really do all the time? They're not actually like producing anything, um, but there's just so many decisions every day that we make and, and partnerships and phone calls and we explore stuff to if we want to do something or, or think about ideas for next year. And it's, it's kind of consuming uh, in the off season. It's, it's, it's really actually consuming in, in the off season, just trying to get um, the company going, going the right way that we think uh, makes the most sense. So yeah, that's mostly what I do in the off season. Obviously we're working on football uh, related stuff with free agency and the draft and, yeah. trades and and all that but um yeah that's that's not as much day-to-day on me right now are you advising on new metrics at the combine i feel like there's got to they could use your input on something down there you're, yeah. not, you're not at the combine but a lot of these guys do go to the combine and you know are, are out trying to outdo each other on twitter with like this guy's uh you know uh running 40s what do you think about all you don't really get involved in that yeah. stuff do you <laughs> No, I, I think that thinking about prospects in a data-driven way is is the best way to do it, right? You know, like I I find it really hard to believe that people can like watch a college football game and there's so many other factors and, and decide whether a guy is going to be good or not. And so like by using more data-driven stuff and not just combine stuff, you know, I think that's a part of it, but I, you know, using their uh, age adjusted rating and their dominant rating, you know, how many, uh, what percent of their team's targets did they earn, you know, where they were they dominant at age 18 or age 19 or were they dominant at age 22? I, you know, that, that makes a big difference too. And so, yeah, I would encourage the combine stuff to be, just be a part of it. I, I do think that it makes a difference though. Like not every great athlete is going to be good uh, at football, but it's really hard to be really good at football unless you're a good athlete, you know? And so a lot of these like workout warrior guys are going to fail, but like, man, it's, it's really hard to be really good if you're not a really good athlete in the NFL. Right. Yeah. Um, I will. Uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up is like kind of where I discovered you is I was always a huge uh football guys fan like they were like the first football podcast i found out with cecil lammy mm-hmm. and uh sigmund bloom who we actually had on our show we were actually talking about fish we weren't even talking about uh football yeah but um as you know and i'm sure this happened with a lot of people like one podcast wasn't enough so i started looking for other fantasy podcasts and i remember the one that you were doing i think was it with Al and Peter a couple of years back, maybe like two or yeah. three years back? You guys were also podcasting along with fantasy as a career was kind of in its infancy too. It wasn't something that everyone was doing. So again, here you are at like the beginning, the tip of the spear of this other type of content. What was that like? Because I would, I would assume that a lot of people were familiar with your writing, but once you were able to do the podcast, like guys like myself, I'm like, wow, I really like what these guys are talking about. Yeah. I hit the subscribe bell, which it's, as you could probably understand, Adam, it's not easy to get people to do something as simple as that. It seems like a sure. big ask, but um, what, how has podcasting changed your career and the trajectory of the entire business? Go yeah, on. for sure. Yeah. The, the podcast I did with Alan Pete, uh, um, we started in 2015 and um yeah, I mean, we were all playing DFS very seriously. Um, they were playing way higher stakes uh, than me at that time. And and yeah, I mean, I think people, a lot of this stuff is aspirational, you know? Like, I, I want to play, you know, tennis like Agassi. I want to play poker like Phil Galfond. And I want to play DFS like Adam and Alan Pete, right? And like, so like the aspirational aspect of it, um, I think made a huge difference. And at that time, like people were just learning what DFS was uh, and how to think about it. And not that we knew exactly how to think about it. I mean, I'm sure if I went back and listened now, we were saying some absolutely ridiculously bad stuff. Um, but, you know, everyone was learning together as it got popular. And so, yeah, I think the podcast, you know, anytime you're playing high stakes and also talking about it, it's going to be successful. Like 
the, these poker streamers, you know, like the guys that are playing one, two, no limit or whatever, like they're never, it's going to be hard for them to be popular. People will sit and watch anybody play, you know, like 501k on, on full tilt, you know, people are going to watch that. And so if you're playing high stakes and also talking about it, I think it's going to be compelling, uh, uh, period. So yeah, that was, um, the, the podcast, I like doing it. I, I like doing podcasts, you know, I, I, I don't mind writing, but I definitely like podcasting more than writing. And, and now, you know, we use the podcast as just like, it's just a way to obviously acquire customers. Like, you know, thousands and thousands of people are listening to the podcast. Obviously only a small fraction of them are going to end up subscribing, but hopefully if they like the podcast enough, they subscribe. And so that's basically the idea. And then we also clip up the whole, every podcast, we put it on Instagram and Twitter. And I don't even know where uh, we, we got a bunch of kids that are actually know what they're doing with social media to to put the clips up everywhere. So, so yeah, it's, 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 the podcast is great. I mean, I think I could see myself in, in some like retired form where I'm just like doing podcasts basically. Um, and it, it's almost like by accident, like the following of the podcast, right? If you have a YouTube channel that gets like, let's an arbitrary number, 10,000 uh, subscribers. Now, you're able to monetize that. And when you set out to do it, maybe were you guys even thinking like that? Now there's like revenue opportunity that you kind of just accidentally fell into, right? Or was that when you guys first started podcasting, did you think like, all right, we're going to start, this is a revenue stream for us. So uh, I think um, at the beginning, uh, DraftKings was paying us to do the podcast. Uh, we were like, you know, DraftKings pros or whatever. And they were paying us to to do the podcast, it was up to them where they wanted to get sponsorships or, or, or whatever on it. I, I, I always thought um, that sponsorships are great, but like the best thing you can do with a podcast is have a product, you know, along with it, you know? And so that was one of the reasons that like, I, we wanted to start establish friends. Like, oh, we have this podcast. We have a lot of people that are listening. You know, I, if a small fraction of them subscribe, you know, we'll be okay. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think having an audience is, is the hard part. You know, once you have an audience, uh, you know, making money is, is the easy part, um, or the relatively easy part, but yeah, getting an audience is obviously hard. Um, and yeah, I, I prefer the having a product way of monetizing the podcast better than that advertising model. You know, like I've read the manscaped ads before and all that. And, uh, I just don't think it's that compelling. I think what is compelling on our podcast specifically is when like fantasy companies advertise, like, you know, if some third tier or second tier DFS site wants to get their name out, you know, like advertising on our podcast is going to go a long way. I think advertising for like Pepsi on our podcast, you know, they're just kind of, I don't want to say wasting their money, but it's not going to have a, a great impact. Yeah, It that, seems like a lot of the, like you and your contemporaries, like Sigma Bloom and some of the other real big podcasters, they, everybody went all in on underdog. Was that a type of opportunity? Like did they come and you don't have to give away the secret sauce if you don't want to, but no. is that the type of stuff that happens nowadays? Like you guys are approached by um, an adjacent or a very related product. And it's like the old school, like we used to come to the radio station, say Adam talk about, uh, you know, shaving razors or, or shaving cream. Is that it? Right. So I, I give all the credit to underdog. I mean, they identified that, influencers in fantasy quote unquote influencers uh, can go a long way and so they incentivized and 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 threw a lot of money around that people that um um to get them to play on underdog and, and honestly to get them to talk about underdog and honestly it's uh, underdog's like I, i'm not paid by underdog in any way i'm not even an investor or anything but the product is awesome and so you know like people really love the app and and best ball and so it worked you know they got everybody talking about underdog everybody in the industry talking about underdog and and yeah that goes uh, a long way. And, and obviously like they were, you know, I, I know Jeremy, I'm friends with Jeremy. I, I love Jeremy. He, he knows who has an impact in the industry and they, they did a great job for sure. I mean, yeah, they're doing great. So what, let me ask you. So as a player, as opposed to what you're doing on, as a podcast, so you play every year and, and how many different fantasy teams do you have? And then you play, you play, you play everything from the day or from the weekly, uh, ones to um do you have also play ones that are for the whole season yeah so i i'm still in a league with my friends from i'm still in a league with my friends from home i'm still in a league with my friends from uh college that's the local uh, league i actually got into a league what'd you say the local league that's what everyone calls it their local league right 
Yeah. And I'm in, yeah. So that stuff's not really for money. You know, I'm just in it for, for fun and, yeah. and to talk shit to my friends or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't really put too much time or effort at all into those. It's kind of consuming to, to try to play fantasy, try to play DFS, um, you know, at, at a high level for, for almost every slate, you know, of, of the year. So yeah. Do you that's think season long is dead if, oh, for no. the most part? Do no, I think no, there's no. still a it, lot of room to run there. Oh my God. Season long just keeps growing. I mean, everybody plays season long. The, the, the issue for season long is, isn't that it's like, how many people are willing to pay real money because like their leagues are free or $10 or $50 or a hundred. I mean, you know, I, it's tough for me to justify someone spending 200 or 300 on, on information if the league's only for 50 bucks or, or for free, you know, but that season long, like not everything has to be about money and, and cut through, you know, I've been guilty of that at times, just like trying to wring the neck of, of my competitors for, for, you know, play really cutthroat. I, I, you can also just play fantasy for fun and, and that's totally fine too. And I think that's, season long for sure yeah i've been doing it for what 12 13 years and you have a league one league that we even give we even engrave our names and send us trophy yeah, around that's it's great fun. you know it's a lot of fun it's called yeah that's great big skin and adam um, but yeah i was gonna say adam but you before we get to a break and uh because i really want to talk a little bit about like your um you know you and evan getting together and established and run you know now in addition to all these things you're doing playing uh podcasting you're actually a business owner and you started a business and i'm sure there was a lot of risk involved with that to a certain extent leaving like a corporate stiff job and going to do it yourself which obviously has um proven to be a, a very successful show but you know some of, in the off season i think you say sometimes you do some of these other type of bets where like you'll play a tennis pro or um it, it, one story i remember you guys were saying i think you were out in vegas and like could you just tell our listeners who might not be familiar with like were you guys drinking a beer once an hour what, what was that like because you're you, you, it seems like you just always want to be betting whether you're in season or not right yeah 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 so like yeah the the best part of, of all this is getting to know a lot of people who um, just want to like play games, you know, like play competition and, and, and bet on it, you know? And so, um, yeah, we did the frying pan, uh, my friend, a former, you know, top 200 tennis player in the world, you know, played on tour and, and, uh, I am, you know, mediocre at best. And, and so he played with a frying pan and I played with my racket and, and, uh, that went three sets and I lost that one. That was devastating. Um, well, I think that deserves uh, for us to go on a break. Hey, everybody. This is Eric from Slate River Farms. You may remember me from episode one, titled Farm to Toilet. I'm just dropping by to remind you to please follow $5 Buzz on Instagram. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and hit the subscription bell on YouTube. That way, you'll never miss an episode. The Buzzards have some great content locked and loaded for season three. I know I'm excited. Also, please check out Slate River Farms' website and our socials. We raise and sell certified grass-fed, grass-finished beef and pastured heritage breed pork on our fourth-generation family farm in upstate New York. Order online and we'll ship our goods directly to your doorstep via one-day shipping for all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and PA. From our pastures to your doorstep, life gets crazy. At SRF, we believe in peace, love, and pork chops. And we're back, uh, everybody, with Adam Levitan from Establish the Run. Uh, Adam, you know, during the days when you were doing the podcast uh, with Al and Peter, it seemed like next season, it was like when Hulk Hogan and Macho Man got together, Evan Silver, who's a pretty big name in the business, if you follow fantasy, and yourself came out with uh, a product called Establish the Run. And I think that was an homage to uh, one of the greatest uh, coaches in NFL history, uh, former uh, Oilers coach, uh, former Tennessee Titans coach. He's still out there. I'm surprised he never gets a look. It's Jeff Fisher. Was that an homage to Jeff Fisher establishing the run? Not really. We, I, I, we had a hard time coming up with the name uh, for sure. You know, I think 
from a, like a SEO perspective or from a, a branding perspective, like having fantasy or having, you know, Roto or something in your name uh, is kind of what most people would do. And um, I thought maybe establishment was a little bit long, but we had a hard time and, and coming up with it. I, and I actually think that it's worked out pretty well because you can acronym it, you know, people just say ETR. And then also um, I think, you know, people, it, it lends itself well to gambling, like, you know, establish the run could mean you're talking about football or it could mean you're like you're on a run and gambling too. And so, oh. yeah, I thought that it's worked. Yeah. And that's interesting. And what was it like? Was there a degree of risk when you and Silva, like did somebody approach you and say, Hey, you guys should be doing this yourself. You guys should be owning the content. Uh, but now, you know, there's a high risk, but there's a high reward. Now you guys are the boss, but I'm sure you have other, I know you have other partners, but what was yeah. that like? Was that like a big leap of faith for someone, you know, to say, Hey, we're going independent right now. Yeah. So I, I actually think that it was like almost no risk and, and that has nothing to do with the business or, or the company. It's like we had spent literally 10 years prior to that building an audience, you know? And so I, I didn't really see where, where the risk was, right? Like we have this audience already. I think if you go and you start a company like this with no audience, like, oh man, you know, there's a ton, a ton of risk. Cause the barrier uh, to entry here is had, nothing. Right. Nowadays, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had uh, an audience and people that we knew really loved us and wanted to hear what we what we had to say, um, and we had ways to amplify it through through Twitter. And so, yeah, I, I thought there was like no risk. And I mean, even if it didn't work out, which is certainly possible, you know, if less people than we thought were interested in paying us, uh, we, there was no risk because we could go back and I could get a job at DraftKings tomorrow. You know, like it, it's what where is the risk? So I actually didn't see it as risk at all. I I thought it was just uh, an absolute no brainer. I actually had the first idea. My first idea was it would just, we, Evan and I wouldn't quit our jobs. We would just literally do a podcast on Friday night about Sunday's games and charge, you know, a hundred bucks a season or something uh, for people to have access to that podcast. And I actually thought that would have done fine. Um, Taylor, you know, Taylor's the man, Taylor KB from uh, poker and everything. Uh, you know, he was like, if you, that's cool. If you just want to like, you know, make a little bit of money. It's, it's not a business, you know? And so uh, he encouraged us to, you know, go bigger and, and hire a team and, and um, make a full blown website and, and not just have, you know, a, a podcast. And so, yeah, it's been, um, it's been great. And, and, you know, I, I think for a lot of people leaving a job to start your own thing is a huge risk for, for us. It just, I just don't see it that way. Got it. And I know Roger wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, the predictive analytics and, you know, I know you had a big win this season and, you know, what's your Roger, you know, I know you had some questions about that approach to it. I just wanted to ask, I mean, first and foremost, you know, obviously people would be interested, you know, what's, what's a good season look like for you as a, as a player, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's, uh, what's some of your biggest winnings, if you could talk about that. Sure. Yeah. I think anybody winning uh, between 10 and 20% ROI over the course of a season, if you're playing a lot is, is crushing. I mean, you know, I, I think back in the day, you know, 2014, 15, 16, uh, you could do 25, 30, 40%, maybe more. Um, these days, I think if you're winning, you know, 10 or 20%, uh, you're really, really, really doing quite well. And so, yeah, that's my goal every year is to, to try to get as close to 20% ROI as, as I can. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a balance there in, in, I could, I could maintain a higher ROI by playing lower stakes. You know, if I just found like the best hundred dollars worth of games against the biggest idiots in the world, my ROI would be more than 20%, but there's like a balance between like playing as big as you can. And then also trying to um, maintain an ROI that, that is acceptable. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to know what your true expectation is, but I, I think anywhere from, 10 to 20% now is, is really good. But can you, can you share any like big winnings that you personally had? Yeah. Yeah. This year I actually had my best year ever, uh, which is crazy because it's gotten so much tougher, but yeah, I, I got lucky in week 16 and got second on the, in the fan duel fan championship for 250 K and, Jeez. and I had a couple other, a uh, couple other smaller ones. Um, I had, a uh, how much did you lay out for that bet? Uh, that the buying on that tournament was only, 250 i think i had like eight entries in it or something like that uh so yeah maybe like 2000 or something but but yeah you know um yeah it it's been good 
you know, trying to play more tournaments where obviously is like put up a little relatively to win a lot. Um, I've been trying to do that more and, and yeah. less grinding of cash and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been good. And then what's, 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 uh, what's been a bad year for you? <laughs> yeah. So by most, by mostly playing cash, which means like I'm playing like you heads up, like just me against you. There's not as much variance as, as you would think. So, um, yeah, I, I think a bad year would be, I think I had a year I only won like 3% or something like that. But, you know, for people that mostly play tournaments, like you could definitely lose a lot in a year. I think if you lose a lot in a year, just playing heads up and, and cash and stuff like that, you know, you need to reconsider uh, what, what you're doing for sure. What were you going to say, Pete? I was just wondering how many hours you put it into, into that in a football season. I mean, is it, is it, is it all around the clock? Essentially, yeah. you wake up and you're back on it. It's hard to tell because a lot of stuff I'm doing for the site and then I'm that also, you know, kind of feeds into me playing also. So, yeah, I would say during the season, um, yeah, I easily work, you know, I'm at my computer 12 hours a day, six, six days a week, I would say. I try not to do too much on Saturdays, but if I was just playing, it would be less uh, for sure. This, I, I count that with, with everything. And how, and how important is the draft? Is that really, is that everything? Or is it the management throughout uh, the season? You know, it's hard to say. I would say maybe 50% or 60% of your team success is the draft, maybe less 45%. I, I don't know, because managing your team and like making the right waiver pickups, I mean, there's going to be everybody on your team is going to get hurt, period. Yeah. Like everybody. And so, especially um, last year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every year, everybody's always hurt. <laughs> These guys are just always hurt. So, you know, I, I think waiver wire trades starting lineup decisions are, are at least 40 45 percent and adam one i think you got this as a listener question one time but <clears throat> now that more and more states are becoming legal gambling states has there ever have you guys ever thought about this or have you ever been approached by like i want to just say like a hedge fund or like an investment advisor where you know they have their sectors of the economy that they're focused on. They have like a tech fund or uh, an oil fund. Now that gambling is legal, has there ever been a thought of like getting a pool of money and hiring someone like yourself or uh, Silva and staking them and say, we're going to get exposure to this market instead of investing in stocks, we're going to have a professional like yourself uh, wager and the winners will participate in the earnings or there's some type of mechanism yeah. where there's, they're not getting exposure in the stock market or the securities market, but they're going out to the gambling market. So yes, uh, uh, people want to do that all the time. What they don't understand is that like actually betting a lot of money is hard to do. Um, really hard to do. You know, my limits are on some sites are like a hundred dollars or $50, you know? And so uh, the sites just aren't going to let you win. Like they're just not going to let you consistently beat them and, and keep your account open period. So um, yeah, it's a great idea in, in theory. Um, executing it is really hard because you need like a whole, I mean, hundreds of people out there betting and trusting them and doing the accounting. And yeah, it's just, it, it, it's just not that feasible. I don't think to do on an institutional level. I, I do think that Susquehanna is doing some arb trading for themselves in sports markets in Ireland. Um but, you know, they obviously have a very sophisticated, like, tech team. And, and I don't know that they're gambling as much as they are arbing. In other words, like, if the line is two and a half on MGM and three and a half on DraftKings, they just bet both sides and pick up the 8% or whatever it is. So, um, yeah. Yeah, because I'm, I would imagine that the desert and some of the, the big casinos out there are um, part of their job is to know who's coming in and making the bets. And they want to have the ability to mitigate loss, right? I mean, yeah, they're running a the business. They're not just going to let you, you know, I, when I first started, when I first signed up for all these apps, all these betting apps, I could bet whatever I wanted, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. And, and gradually they see that you're winning. And then now my, I get most I can bet is like $50. So, you know, they're just people, I think the public has a big misunderstanding of like what's actually happening, you know, like they, they just don't realize that if they ever got good at this and, and won, they wouldn't be able to bet anymore. Yeah. Cause I know and you that talked Wait, I was gonna say that, that limits on you personally. Yes. Yeah. Wow. On my on my account. Yeah. There's really no way to 
to to find it's tough and tougher to find an edge now especially with it automation and AI and everyone's yeah. watching, right? It's people are watching 24 hours a day. The big, the biggest edge is if you don't want to bet a lot, if you want to bet 50 or hundred, I mean, you can find some huge edges, you know, nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to limit you. Nobody's, there's not gonna be any problem. You want to bet a hundred bucks on a WNBA game. That that's fine. I think the question comes, comes to people, you know, is it worth my time to become a WNBA expert and then only bet a hundred dollars on a bet that has like an expectation of, you know, 8% or, or something like that. Yeah. And got uh, one, one other question as it just, cause we're talking about basketball um, established the run is uh, hyper focused on football, but you guys launched another product recently called uh, it, it was established to run basketball. And it, you know, I, I'm, I keep kicking myself next year. I want to follow the prop bets you guys are laying because I think you guys are having just like a really outrageous success rate. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, the props thing is crazy. I mean, we, you know, we wanted to do the props thing because we were already doing all the work for it. You know, uh, betting is not hard if you have the right numbers. And so we have people all over the globe constantly working on our NBA projections uh, in all time zones. And so when the lines come out, all we do is compare our projection. You know, we have John Morant for 26 points and his line is 30 and a half points. And, you know, you just look at it and uh, we talk about it a little bit. And if we think that the projection is good and, and we want to bet it, that, then we bet it. I mean, the, the hard part is getting to the projection and making sure that it's really, really, really good. Uh, the projection is the easy part is finding the stuff to bed. And so we still figured we already had all this stuff. We might as well just, just help the people and, and, and bet some props. And it's been, yeah, I mean, it's been a, a, a easy market to beat, I would say. That's interesting. So do you, so you make other bets outside of, you know, say, you know, draft Kings or your, 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 you know, uh, uh, fantasy. So you, you place bets, you know, the over under point spread. I mean, you do all that too. Uh, rarely, almost never. Oh. I, I think that um, like a, a good hold for like a professional sports better, not, you know, not, not a fantasy player, like professional sports better, like a good hold would be like 3% over the course of a year. Uh, and so they're just trying to like bet insane volume and win 3% just because the markets are so efficient, you know, like NFL lines. I mean, I, I, He's very skeptical that anyone can beat NFL lines if they're betting, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I, I'd, I'd be very, very skeptical that they can actually win. And if they are winning, it might be like 3%. And so it's just not a market that that I think is is suited to my skill set or, or really all that profitable. The good news about markets like that is you can bet a, a ton no matter who you are. You know, like if you want to bet NFL, I mean, you can get 50, 100K, you know, no, no problem. But uh, if it's game day, but, you know, again, I think, their expectation on that might be like one, two, three percent. And when you start running that through like a simulator, like you could lose, I mean, you could lose a ton if your edge is only three percent before you realize your how expectation. Did, how do they get those spreads and those numbers so exact? It's week in and week out. It blows <laughs> my mind. So the opener is, you know, obviously everybody's working from similar data uh, and there's no secrets in the NFL, you know. Uh, so I think all the inputs that people are using for their models are, are relatively similar. And then by the time, Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes, the market has been beaten into shape. You know, a line could open Texans minus four and it and it could close Texans minus six. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes a, a huge, huge, huge difference. And so like those lines aren't moving because um, somebody went in and bet $100, you know, like they know which accounts are professional. And so if somebody comes in and bets 100K on Texans minus four, they move it to four and a half. And then if someone bets 100K again at four and a half, they move it to five. And so by the time the line is, is where it is, it's like almost perfectly efficient, you know. Or an accumulative amount of heavy betting on one side too, right? Yeah, if it's respected players, for sure, yeah. Um, one of the things that I like to do and kind of fun and, and this year listening to Evan was pounding the table on uh, Evan Silva, who's uh, Adam's partner, was pounding the table on um, Cooper Cup winning MVP. And I told anybody mm -hmm. that, you know, I got one right, Adam, but uh, I heard it from you guys. And I, uh, dude, I, my, even my wife is ecstatic. It's like fucking, but they, they held you in suspense. They wouldn't, they weren't announcing the MVP for so long. Like, let's get to the fucking MVP. And he won it. But one that I fucking whiffed on, and I think you guys might have liked it, I think in the beginning of this year was Jamar Chase, rookie of the year uh coming in i what is is 80 to one sound appropriate was that what the opening like the odds were for him to win rookie of the year oh i doubt it i mean was no it, way yeah he, he was like won? the number five overall pick i i doubt it um, well they I came out with this really ridiculous story like in training camp he like didn't like the way yeah. like 
what were they saying? The ball was coming out. Like he looked sloppy. Yeah, he said he couldn't couldn't catch the ball without because it didn't have stripes like the college ball does. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. something really ridiculous. And that move, I, I would I was at the casino because I did a bunch of uh, future preseason futures bet, and that um, I got moved off because I think that day somebody was talking about him that bullshit story and it's crazy yeah. how i think you guys talk about how like the, the beat writers are kind of just like a propaganda arm for the team they're not really giving the gambling public what they're looking for and you know that uh, uh, yeah i wouldn't say they're propaganda for the team but they're there to cover the team with wins and losses not fantasy stuff you know and so like and they're also not like football guys you know if they say that a guy looks like he's coming out of his break slow like i just don't think they really know what they're talking about and so i think people get get trapped in in uh too much of the subjective stuff from the media when really you know all that matters is is how a player is going to be used not not what some guy thinks like his hip swivel looks like yeah as a you know you know since you're so invested particularly in sports particularly in football do you have a favorite team? Do you have any, do you have specific teams that are, that you can get emotional about? No, I, uh, I grew up rooting for the Redskins. They used to be called the Redskins when I lived in Virginia. Yeah. Um, I, I cared somewhat then about them and, and the bullets and the capitals and, and the Orioles. Um, now, uh, you know, I, it would be impossible for me to care less about, about which team wins, wins or loses. Ow. Because it's all about, yeah. The, the, yeah, I, I also just think like I have like a control problem, you know, like well, why should I get emotionally invested in something I have no control over? You know, they're making trades and lineup decisions and they're making all these decisions that I have no input in. And so how can I, after they make decisions, like get upset? Like that seems crazy. I didn't have anything to do with it, you know, or be happy, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's just not for me rooting for teams anymore. Yeah, I agree with you on that one, man. I mean, we have friends that just get so... <laughs> crazy over the teams uh, i'm like they can't hear you they right. they, they can't hear what you're saying the coach no. can't hear you right now <laughs> and they're making because you're watching and you're buying stuff they're making billions of dollars and when they yeah. win what you get zero you know it's just you know it's just the 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 model uh, i don't know i don't know what the answer is but but i think like it's just crazy to me to root for teams i think the answer is happening gambling it's yeah the explosion of it i mean sure. it's I, I listen to the golf channel on my way into work sometimes and they have a whole segment on golf prop bets for 45 minutes and i'm in a, they would never have been doing that a, a couple years ago you <laughs> yeah. know have you ever bet on golf <laughs> oh yeah no, yeah but i mean dude, it's, no, a, a lot of people, it, it's blowing up as, as, a, golf. as a place to golf is so fun to bet on Go golf yeah. is awesome 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 yeah I, i've I work with uh, uh, one of the best golf betters in the world, and and it's amazing to to bet on golf when uh, it's going well. It's it's so fun. It's 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 awesome. Adam, yeah, I mean, it's, oh, go ahead. It's interesting. Go ahead. I was going to say two quick questions, and I know uh, we want to be mindful of your time, but two quick questions is how impactful is uh, the MLB strike and possible loss of the season? I know you're probably not a big MLB guy, but how impactful is that to the betting markets and what kind of damage do you think it does to the sport? Like, especially when we're in a high inflation environment and the pandemic and just like what we're saying, a lot of people, like I used to be a huge Yankee fan. Like when, when I lived in New York city and the Yankees and Red Sox play in like Oh three Oh four, it was like a fucking mm -hmm. Holy war. You saw yeah. a guy with a Boston hat on and you saw a lot of them in New York. It like you felt when the Red Sox were there, it was palpable. You could feel it. And that feeling it's like Pink Floyd. Where is the feeling gone? It's like you don't have it anymore. So when MLB goes on strike, what like what does that do to them long term? Uh, yeah, I thought baseball was in trouble long term. Anyways, I mean, yeah. kids, I, I don't want my kids to even play baseball because they don't get any fucking energy out. You know, like they're out of control. They can't stand there and watch someone else hit. You know, for ten minutes, like that is, uh, it's just it's not good for them, and so they don't like to watch it. They don't want to play it. I mean, they actually do want to play it. I don't want them to play it because they come home and they're still out of control. They haven't gotten any, any energy out, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think baseball is in trouble, period. Like, uh, lockout or not, like, I think baseball is in big, big trouble. I think 20, 30, 40 years, I could see golf. I could see UFC. I could see a bunch of sports, something we don't even know yet, uh, being well ahead of baseball. Wow. That's and crazy. to that point, you, one of the things I know that you've uh, talked about on your show is 
how do you describe it? Virtual horse racing or like, uh, what is that? Oh, yeah. One, didn't someone, someone uh, tell the story, but it's super intriguing how there's like simulated horse racing games. There's so many ridiculous things out there and people are, are spending money on it, right? We're gambling. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, you're referring to Zed, which is yeah. uh, like a Ethereum based, Ethereum blockchain horse racing game, essentially. I, I actually think that it's like one of the best use cases for Ethereum blockchain. Like there's so much bullshit out there, you know, pictures of apes and stupid PFP projects that are, have zero value, zero fun whatsoever. I mean, playing on Zed is like actually owning a horse. Like you have to race it, you have to breed it, you have to be mindful of its fatigue. You have to understand like what uh, distances it runs well at. You have to decide when to buy it, when to sell it. Like it's a full blown game. Like you actually own a real racehorse, but instead of dealing with you know, fucking horses dying or getting sick or, or who else knows it's all on the computer and it's all just, it's great. I actually think it's awesome. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we spent uh, an ungodly and an ungodly amount of money to acquire uh, a stable of, of race horses that are, uh, you know, some of the best horses, which is, which is good. Uh, I haven't been grinding the racing and the breeding probably as much as I, I should, but it's a cool game, man. And, and I think it just shows like everything is, the best part about like blockchain technology is like everything's verifiable. So like people are like, Oh, how do you know the races aren't fixed? I mean, if I actually knew what I was doing and some people do, you could go into the blockchain and see like that the random number generator and everything. And, and it had all the horses were uh, all their specifications for each race and everything. And so, yeah, it's, it's cool. And you can make money doing that. There's a ton of money in, in, in Zed. I, you know, they don't have real high stakes racing yet, but yeah, I think people are, people are making, um, if you have good horses and you know what you're doing, breeding and, and selling them on the market and stuff like that, I, I would not shock me if people are making, you know, um, three, four, five, ten 10 Ethereum a month, uh, you know, which is, which is real yeah. money. I mean, you know, Ethereum is around $3,000. So yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot. Horse racing makes me think of, um, you know, I was just trying to think of, I always try to bring movies into it to a little bit. Remember the Richard Dreyfuss film, Let It Ride? The underappreciated little gem where he's, you know, has that one great day. <laughs> Ever seen that movie? I vaguely I remember so. that, but it wasn't there so that really funny. ill-fated horse racing show that was supposed to be uh, after The Sopranos came out. They, oh, yes, Dennis Farina yep. was in it, and like three or four Dustin horses Hoffman. died like right away. And they're like, All right, it was Dustin out. Hoffman and Nick Nolte, and it was a David Mamet's TV show. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so three, they during the time they were making it, three or four horses did die, and then they had to cancel the whole show for crazy. <laughs> But uh, I just wondered if you had any favorite gambling movies, like the Cincinnati oh. Kid or anything like that. Yeah, I, I thought the pool movie. What was it called with Tom Cruise? Uh, two for the money or or oh, uh, Tom Cruise? You're talking about Color of Money. Color of Money. Yeah, it was I, easy I, sequel to The Hustler. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought that was um, uh, really good. Um, there haven't been that many, you know, you know, what's crazy about rounders is that like, I know that's like the cliche answer for anyone. Rounders came out before the poker boom, like before everyone was playing poker and they like hit it on the head. Like it's still like, not everything of course, but like a lot of it like still holds up to like uh, what's actually going on in, in poker, what was going on then in poker in New York. And like, man, I mean, for them to get it right uh, before there was really any information out there about it, all every poker movie since has been absolutely atrocious, you know? Yeah. And so I think it was the Koppelman brothers that did that did rounders. I mean, credit to them. There, it was. It, it's really an amazing movie, um, considering it stood up yeah. through the boom. That's right. I I just remember an old movie called The Gambler. Uh, they remade it with Mark Wahlberg, but the original yeah. had James Caan, yeah. directed by James Toback. You ever seen that one? Yeah, that I did. More about yeah. sports betting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the trouble he got in. <laughs> it's a little Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky famously used to love to lose gambling. And you got Casino, yeah, which I, isn't necessarily about gambling, but still a great film, I thought. Yeah. Casino, obviously, if you consider that a gambling movie, one of the best movies ever. I, I thought The Cooler was was oh, good. Not really yeah. a gambling movie, but it was a well-done movie. Yeah. And I saw that California Split movie, too. I thought that was okay. That was, like, from the 70s. Robert Altman with Elliot Gould and Yeah, George exactly. Eagle. Yep. I actually love that movie because he... It, for different reasons, though, not not necessarily about because it's about the gambling, but it's about the methods and the, what he used, the way he shot it and the way everybody talks on top of each other. They was like playing with uh, sound oh. recording. 
I almost forgot one of my best movies of all time, Gambling or Not. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Sting, of course, with, with Robert Redford, Best Picture. Yeah, I don't know if that's considered a gambling movie, but man, that's one of my favorite movies ever. Sleight of hand gambling movie. Yeah. <laughs> Mix awesome. the two up. <laughs> Adam, um, you guys got anything yeah. else? Because we're getting close to, uh, we're coming up against the clock here, sadly. Um, well, Adam, well, I he- really, go, go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. Oh man, it was, it's been enjoy. It's been enjoyable to speak with you. I, I think that, you know, one point you made earlier, I'd like to just uh, reiterate to everybody is you get into something, you get into a, any project, you know, get in early it, then you learn to be the best. A lot of people don't seem to understand that. That's a, it's a very good point. And I congratulate you on your success yeah, I appreciate and it. foresight for doing that. And thanks appreciate for sharing it. the story. Yeah. And guys, as uh, listeners established a run, I would say it's probably the definitive uh, DFS gambling NFL product out there. And I'm kicking myself, check out their NBA uh, props. They're, they're really killing it right now. And um, Adam, are there any plans to uh, grow the brand into any other verticals or any chance Daigle's joining the team or is that still, is that, is that speculation? No, Daigle uh, did a deal with uh, four for four. So unfortunately we don't have Daigle, but, but yeah, uh, I think we'll expand to more sports. You know, it's it's just hard you know, I I don't, I think it's no matter how much money we made in the short term, in the long term, it's always bad to have a bad bad product, you know? So if we, if we uh, were to expand to another sport, you know, it's, it's gotta be uh, what we think is, is the best possible product. And so that's, you know, it's harder than it seems to, to kind of execute on that. So, so yeah, we'll see how it goes. Awesome. And a quick plug for skin to fur. So what's that about? Yes. Skin to fur is a, a very professional ebook that uh, I wrote uh, maybe a couple years ago. And, and basically it's just a bunch of the, I do these listener questions on my podcast and, and I think a lot of the questions are funny and, and, and some of the answers I do, I think are funny. And so I wanted to kind of preserve them a little bit. So I just kind of turned a lot of my favorite questions that people ask me and answers into a into a book and so that's it so it's kind of an oral history <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so is that uh, we pretty much wrapped up gentlemen yeah rog if you want to take us out uh thank you adam i'm uh, looking forward to the solo pods and stuff you dropping over the uh you know while we wait for uh the nfl season it's always nice to see uh establish the run pop up in the uh in the feed, you know, especially when it's not that busy right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate it. Cool, man. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening in on another episode of $5 buzz. If you have any questions, comments, ideas for topics or future guests, please email us at $5 buzz. And that's F I V E D O L L A R B U Z Z at gmail.com. And we'll get back to you as soon as we get done counting all of our cash from all that money we won. Well, hopefully. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.